gamers all around the flat universe today we're doing something juicy something spicy and that is explaining when and how and why to make each of the landmarks for every Civ in AoE 4 we just did a straw poll on twitch and people seemed interested i'm just explaining when should you make the the landmark how good it is and all the good stuff so the first one we'll go through is english and english uh age to landmarks are the council hall and abbey of kings uh council hall is the more standard especially in the lower leagues uh because you get access to longbowmen and they get produced uh faster and you can just push really quickly and and do some damage so overall council hall is more used and if you want to rush or if you want to defend even uh council is a very uh good option if you want to go second dc abbey of kings on the other hand is very very underused in lower leagues and i feel like recently at the high higher leagues has been used more and more and you use abbey of kings when you want to rush castle or go double stable horsemen in feudal so that you can pull back your horsemen and heal them or like i said if you rush castle uh you go instantly into knights knights you know have a lot of health they take uh a lot less damage than a horseman and then whenever your unit gets low health you can send it back to abbey of kings to heal up and the reason why this is not as used at lower levels is because it requires a lot of micromanagement and a lot of micro but abbey of kings is not a bad sieve if you got a apm if you are also playing a more cavalry based style uh h3 landmarks for english uh, they're pretty straightforward, like you almost never ever see White Tower uh, and the reason for that is uh, if you're rushing castle you always want to go for King's Palace uh, because it, it's an extra TC and it's going to boost your economy. So this is pretty much standard, I feel like in no matter what you do. The only time I would advise to go White Tower is if you're playing on a map like King of the Hill or if you open with double TC and you have a lot of villagers already and your opponent is one TC, so you just want to make sure you don't die, you know, want to make sure you're safe, you go white tower and you kind of just keep your advantage. Or if you did some like severe damage to your opponent where they got like 10 workers and they're counterattacking and if you defend you're fine, I would say go white tower, but otherwise King's Palace is almost always better. Imperial landmarks, uh, Bircher Palace and Vingard Palace. Uh, Bircher, it's just not that great to be honest. I, I feel like you will almost always go for Wingard Palace. And in a way, it's the same thing as the White Tower King's Palace. You will go Wingard like 90% of the times. But if there's ever a point where your opponent is all leaning in castle and you're ahead in economy, but they're pushing and you're about to die, I would say go Bircher. Or if you're playing on King of the Hill, you can plop it down on the middle. Otherwise, Wingard Palace is just so, so efficient in what it can do. And long term, it's going to provide much, much more value. Now, one thing to, to note is uh, Berkshire is basically like a super strong keep. And it requires wood to repair, unlike with the recent changes where keeps require stone to repair. So that's something to consider as well. If you're super far ahead in the economy, uh, you can go Berkshire. But... Uh, most of the time people do go Wingard because you get those trebs super, super cheap. Uh, let's do French next. French School of Cavalry and Chamber of Commerce. Uh, School of Cavalry is like, you know, the go-to landmark for pretty much any map, anytime. You always go School of Cavalry, especially in one-on-ones because it's just good. Uh, it acts as a stable. You can instantly put pressure on opponent and all your stables produce units 20% faster but there is use for chamber of commerce and that is in two situations first situation is in team games chamber of commerce is used especially in like 4v4s because especially in lower leagues when people don't rush you can go chamber of commerce and just trade boom from the get-go another map specifically that chamber of commerce is used is water maps uh and when i say water maps i mean island maps because if you're playing an island map where you know you're far away from your opponent and you cannot access it by land there's no real point to uh, go for School of Cavalry because you won't be able to harass anyway. Going for Chamber of Commerce and getting any trade at any point with uh, docks or, or markets, whatever, uh, will just give you so, so, so many more resources because it also affects uh, trade ships. Otherwise, if you're playing on a land map, especially one-on-ones, it kind of sucks. Uh, H3 for French 
is Royal Institute and Guildhall. Both of these landmarks are quite good and both of them are, are used quite a bit. Royal Institute has become uh, used quite a lot more in the recent times uh, in one-on-ones because it allows uh, French to get the Imperial upgrades, the bonus health for cavalry, and then just kind of keep fighting in castle with your opponent. But Guildhall is also viable uh, and very good, especially now that uh, keeps cost stone to repair. So you can actually put your Guildhall in stone and just have infinite keeps basically. Now, when to go for which one? Uh, if you want to play more aggressive in castle and you want to try to end the game or you already have a lead and you want to finish the game, uh, or if the opponent is playing a sieve that is also like very cavalry based and you want to go go at it, you go Royal Institute because of that upgrade. But if you want to look for, you know, going into Imperial or more macro oriented play, or maybe you're in, you know, in team games or whatever, uh, then Guildhall is a lot better. So it's, it's more of a what situation you are what kind of situation you are in game and what kind of playstyle you prefer. And then the Imperial Landmarks for French. Uh, Red Palace is uh, probably the strongest keep in the game. It, it does, uh, regarding uh, Landmarks, it does so, so much damage. And each garrison unit adds additional, like the, the French crossbow that I can't pronounce, Arbalist. So it does a crap ton of DPS. Uh, the problem is it's just a keep at the end of the day, so if you manage to get it in a good spot, you can use it, but uh, College of Artillery is, you know, you get better Siege, and even more important, you get access to Royal Culverins. So if your playstyle is uh, Siege-based, if the map is getting kind of split or something, I would suggest going College of Artillery, because French do not have access to Culverins. Uh, so the only way to get Culverins as French is making College of Artillery and also your Royal Cannons are going to be a bit better. But again, if you're in a situation where you're ahead but you might be dying or you're trying to kill your opponent and you can place Red Palace super aggressively and win the game off of that or block an important part of the map, then you can go Red Palace. So uh, French Age 3 and Age 4 landmarks, I think both uh, have uses uh, and it's more so dependent on which one you prefer and what point in the uh, game you are. Uh, let's do Mongols. Mongols, Deerstones, the Silver Tree. So uh, Deerstones is the one that increases the movement speed of all your units within the range of outposts and this landmark. This is a more economic landmark where, um, you know, it gives movement speed to your units, it gives movement speed to your villagers early on, increasing the, uh, the gather rate. And this is the, you know, more standard one, more common one, it's pretty good. On the other side, you got the Silver Tree, which acts as a market and you build traders 50% faster and at 50% reduced gold cost. Now, uh, this landmark is very, very... It's viable in one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not gonna say it's, it's bad, it is viable. It's possible to win with it on specific maps. Uh, but it's this landmark is very popular in team games specifically because uh, usually the maps are big enough where you can start trading and if you start the Mongol trade you can get insane amounts of gold available to you and just kind of run away with the game so I uh, would definitely recommend in team games at least because it's very very good. Um, H3 landmarks we got Kurultai and Step Readout. Step Readout is the standard one it acts as a drop off point it increases your gold dropped off by 50% and um, yeah, this one is the standard one. The only time uh, you actually go Kurul Tai, which what it does is it heals units plus one every second and also gives you 25% damage if your Khan is nearby uh, Kurul Tai as well. Now, the only time you actually go this landmark is when you go Silver Tree. Because if you go Silver Tree for trading, you're going to have way too much gold. So you don't need to go Step Readout for bonus gold. You, you go Kurul Tai. Uh, because it's like, well, I don't need step readout, so I might as well make this. But in normal games, if you go deer stones, you always go step readout because 50% gold is just a massive, massive um, bonus to to your gold economy. And then H4 landmarks is Kaganate Palace and the White Stupa. Now this landmark sucks. Uh, that's it. It sucks. Why does it suck? Well, uh, what it does is it spawns a cavalry or a cavalry army of horsemen, mangudai, or lancers every 90 seconds. Now, if you could potentially pick which one you spawn, um, you know, maybe 
It spawns horsemen every 60 seconds, Mangoda every 90, and lancers every 120. You can pick. Maybe it would be a decent landmark. But the problem is, it's just random, and it can spawn like horsemen, horsemen, horsemen three times in a row. And in age four landmarks, spawning horsemen, not the greatest thing, right? But if it spawns lancers, that's pretty good. So it, it's just not very used landmark, uh, I feel like. And again if you're potentially trying to end the game instantly you could go this landmark for a little bit of army boost but the white stupa is the standard one <clears throat> it acts as an uvu produces 240 stone per minute and it never runs out so if you make white stupa you're gonna have 240 stone per minute for the rest of the game and you're also gonna provide the influence radius from uvu that boosts the either production of the buildings or gives you extra upgrades or whatever so you can basically upgrade your towers um, forever, right? You're never gonna run out of stone. And White Stupa is the, the more popular one. Next sim we'll be talking about is Rus. Uh, Rus field landmarks are Kremlin and the Golden Gate. Uh, the Golden Gate is the standard one and the Golden Gate is possibly the best or second best landmark in the game out of any sim uh, in any age. It is so, so, so good and every minute you basically get like a ticket and you can buy resources so for example you can sell 100 food and you can get 150 gold for it or you can buy uh or sorry you can sell wood and you get 150 gold for it or you can buy stuff for 100 gold and it gives you 150 resources the reason why this is popular is because most feudal landmarks expire in terms of value as the game goes you know they kind of become worse and worse but Golden Gate is always good, and in the late game you can buy stone. So usually when you buy from a market, um, the more you buy a resource, the worse trade you're getting. But with Golden Gate, it's always 100 gold for 150 stone. So late game you can buy as much stone as you want, you can never technically run out of it as long as you have gold. And it just allows you to also make some good switches regarding resources, like you can buy sell a bunch of food and go you know fast castle or sell uh, wood and go castle uh super quickly without mining any gold so it's just a very good landmark it's very standard no matter what play style you go on the other side you have the uh the underwhelming kremlin uh it basically uh, it's just a, a wooden fortress with more health um <clears throat> I've tried this landmark many, many times. It, it, there's just not much use from it, and it's just not that great. Like I said, it's just a big wooden fortress, and even if you get it up at a good spot, it doesn't actually do that much compared to the other keep landmarks because it is an H2 landmark. And uh, in the long run, Golden Gate will just provide you um, better value. H2 landmarks for uh, Rus, and this is one of the landmarks I get ask the most which landmark do you go because technically these landmarks do a very similar or slash same thing <clears throat> so abbey of the trinity and high trade house uh abbey of the trinity is the more common one and a lot of people ask me why do you sometimes go high trade house and sometimes abbey what is the reason the reason is very simple whenever you play Rus, you are us usually right the one to age up to castle first and if you are to, uh, about to age up first to castle, going Abbey of the Trinity is better because you can get um, monks out faster and you can go pick up the relics and get that uh, gold income secured. So potentially if you manage to capture five relics, you get 500 gold a minute. This landmark, you know, definitely pays off in that sense. But if you age up second in one-on-one -on -one and your opponent already got two relics, it's not really worth to go Abbey because by the time you finish the Abbey and you get the Monk out, there's a chance your opponent might grab another one or two relics and then there's nothing you can do with this landmark. Like maybe you'll get one relic, but that's not worth it. On the other side, High Trade House, uh, not only it will spawn deer every 60 seconds, allowing you to hit 500 bounty, but it, it will also generate gold if you place it near wood lines. So there's some maps where you can get like really good high trade houses, like providing 300 gold a minute, which is equal to three relics. So if you don't think you can grab the relics or you think that you have a really good spot for a high trade house, it's potentially even better 
in certain situations if you get 300 gold a minute uh, and you get deer to boost your bounty to 500 that is a pretty good deal and it doesn't require you to build any monks for it so um, there it is that's how you decide when and how to go between two of these <clears throat> and the imperial landmarks for Rus this is the more common one the high armory it decreases the cost of your siege engines in nearby siege workshops by 20% um, here we go so you guys can see it better and it contains unique siege upgrades. Now this is a more common one because Faskaya Tower is basically a keep <clears throat> that has bombard emplacement, I think, built into it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, with all weapon emplacements, okay, and increased health. Um, now, this was never used before the patch because, like I said, it's just a keep <clears throat> at the end of the day. And this one had even better upgrades. Now recently the devs changed it so that it also unlocks stone walls, stone gates and sto stone wall towers for Rus. I still think that it's not very good and it kind of follows the same pattern of the other keep landmarks in Castle and Imperial Age. If you're winning and you want a secure location or you're going for sacred side win, you can go to the sky tower. But if you're playing a more balanced game where you don't quite know where it's gonna go, I would probably go for high armory. Because building a landmark just to get access to stone walls is not that great of a deal, right? It's more like a bonus, not so much a reason to go for that. So, <clears throat> yeah. But the, the, the uh, siege engineering, the high armory a landmark is uh, pretty, pretty good. Alright, next one we'll talk about is Abbasid. Um... I'll just talk through the wings. Uh, Abbasid, uh, as you may or may not know, has one landmark, uh, plus TC that is also a landmark. And in House of Wisdom yeah, is the landmark, and every time you age up, you can go through four different wings. So you have Culture Wing, uh, Economic Wing, Military Wing, and Trade Wing. So when do you go each wing? A rule of thumb is you almost always, 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 always go for uh, Economic Wing that reduces uh, the cost of your villagers by 50%, making each villager 25 food. The only time where you would go for culture wing first is if you're playing on a map like Boulder Bay or Island Maps, where all your food eco will be focused on water. And if you have that water eco, just you will have insane amounts of food and you don't need economic wing to make your villagers cheaper because you already have insane food eco. So you would rather go culture wing and you will get a reduced uh, cost of all technology by 30%. So that is the, the more important one, but I would say economic wing on every other map, unless you're solely focusing on water economy for your food. Uh, you always go eco. Uh, if you have a map like islands or something, you can go culture wing. Military wing is very army focused and you don't really get full value from military wing until later on until you have like 80 100 uh, army supply it's not worth to get uh military wing for like five units and then trade wing i mean if you're playing team games you can open potentially trade wing or get trade wing in castle uh if you want to go for some kind of trade boom but usually this wing is reserved for once you research the first three wings and then you get this one one thing that a lot of people don't know is there's three age ups but there's four wings so a lot of people don't know that you can actually get all four wings so if you go eco wing first to feudal culture wing to castle and you go military wing and imperial once you hit imperial you can still get the trade wing so you can unlock uh these three upgrades so if you didn't know that uh there you go but the reason like i said why you never go military uh in feudal or in castle the wing is because you don't have quite enough units to get the value off of it and culture and eco wing will pretty much always be better unless you're doing some super secret timing delhi delhi fuel is they got tower of victory and dome of faith uh dome of faith is a much 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 more popular one because delhi gameplay is based around scholars and you know getting to castle capturing the sacred sites elephants healing and all that so this is the the more popular pick tower of victory uh i've tried it i've played around with it it doesn't make sense to go one tc tower of victory you could potentially go double or even triple uh, town center 
with Tower of Victory, but like I said, I've played around with it, and even if you decide to go double or triple TC with Delhi, uh, I think that Dome of Faith is still better because it's gonna allow you to produce cheaper, uh, sorry, to yeah, to produce cheaper scholars and get those upgrades going even faster. So, yeah, Tower of Victory. He needs a little bit of something else to, to make uh, really viable and good, I would say. Now, H3 Landmarks for Delhi uh, is very up and down, I feel like. Uh, one week, everyone's using Compounded Defender, then the other week, everyone is using House of Learning. So, when do you go which landmark? Um, if you want to go for a bunch of walls, if you want to go for a lot of keeps, if you want to attack offensively with like elephants and keeps, you can go compounded defender because you will get everything reduced by 25%. Uh, so this also reduces cost on your keeps and your wonder. So if you're playing like a FFA or something, it's pretty good because it's going to reduce the cost of your wonder. And I would say this is for more like walling off the map or aggressive play. Meanwhile, House of Learning is more focused on a different kind of playstyle, and the main reason is Honed Blades. What that does is Men at Arms and Lancers equip something, and you have plus three extra damage. So if your playstyle is heavy Lancers, if your playstyle is heavy Men at Arms, if you go Tower of Victory going into House of Learning, it's pretty good because then you can get Honed Blades for your Men at Arms. And you're gonna get 20% attack speed for them as well. So this is the main reason why you go House of Learning. There's also this upgrade for Imperial. But if your place, like I said, is Lancers, you know, run buys or Man at Arm Crossbow, Man at Arm Elephants, this is a landmark that's uh, pretty good for that. You can't really go wrong with either one. It's just style dependent and uh, what you prefer. Recent times I've been preferring uh, Compounded Defender, but I've seen many players go for uh, House of Learning as well. So, something you gotta try and see what works for you. And the last two landmarks for Imperial, for Delhi, are Palace of the Sultan and Hisser Academy. I'll be honest, both of them kind of suck. Um, probably the most underwhelming Imperial Age landmarks. Uh, one of them provides, if you have like most of the stuff researched, provides like four to 600 food per minute, which is not that a lot. It's like 15, 20 villagers worth of income. Uh, and you you never really run out of food late game. If you got 50 farms, you're not gonna run out of food, right? Um, so if you don't wanna micromanage anything, just plop down this landmark and you're good to go. Hisar was generating 3K per minute yesterday. No, I did not. It does not generate that much. It generates like four to six hundred. Um, and then you got Palace of the Sultan. Now this one is a little bit interesting because it requires four um, scholars inside. And it will automatically produce Tower Elephants. I think it's every hundred and something seconds. Uh, I am not sure. But... Technically, if you're completely out of gold and you're not trading, this is a decent landmark because it will give you a tower elephant that costs 600 gold uh, every like 100 and something seconds. The downside is you do have to put four scholars inside, which is four supply that's going to be dead. Um, so, you know, it's a trade-off. Like I said, they're not, neither of them are, are great landmarks. So, it's up to you what you like. If you want to produce elephants for free in Imperial, go for it another problem is if you're imperial and you're supply capped like you're 200 or 200 the elephant will not come out so the queue will just be stuck so technically you're not even going to produce elephants constantly right um next one we'll be talking about is holy roman empire now we got two landmarks in feudal might work palace uh it's called might work, but it, it never really does work. Uh, and then you got the Aachen Chapel. Aachen Chapel is probably, like a, like with the Golden Gate, one of the best uh, landmarks. It is incredibly, incredibly good. It boosts your economy in feudal age when you're kind of trying to rush up to castle. And it's also very useful in the imperial age and in castle. And this is why it's one of the best landmarks. Like I said, 
Uh, most landmarks in Feudal Age kind of drop off the later the game goes. Not Akin Chapel, it's very, very good. You put a prelate inside and it buffs all the villagers around it, increases the gather rate by 40%. So it's really, really good. Mighty Work Palace, uh, value wise, it sucks. The only time you want to go Mind Work Palace is if your whole game plan with HRE is to go Mind Work Palace for cheaper upgrades and then you go into Burgrave Palace to all in your opponent with just mass men at arms. If you're looking for any kind of macro gameplay, I would say go Akin Chapel or if you're, perhaps you're getting tower rushed or something, you can go Mind Work Palace to get the siege engineering upgrade 40% cheaper and 40% faster. But like I said, if you're looking for more standard long-term gameplay, Acton Chapel is the way to go, unless you want to all in or you're defending a tower rush that's super hard to defend. Age 3 landmarks for HRE, they're very, very different, so the choice is very obvious and uh, not necessarily situational, it's just like what you prefer to go for. Um, similar to these two, if you want a more macro oriented play, more long term, you go Regnet's Cathedral that will give you twice the amount of gold. Um, when you capture a relic. So if you can capture the relics, if you have the map control, or if you think you can survive whatever your opponent is throwing at you, you can get the relics, go for Regnus Cathedral, it's gonna give you way more value. But if you're planning to all in, uh, in castle with just mass men at arms, you go Burger Palace that produces units 400% faster. So if you wanna, you can go Mind Work Palace into Burger and just print units and try to all in. Or you can even go Akin Chapel into Burger and just put some pressure on your opponent. And Burger Palace is also very, very good if you are getting all in and you don't have any production, you just got cat or you're going castle, you go Burger Palace and you'll quickly be able to produce uh, a lot of men at arms in, in order to be able to um, defend yourself. And the last two landmarks in Imperial are Elsbach Palace and Palace of Swabia. Now, Palace of Swabia is one of the best landmarks in the game. Uh, H3 has a lot of good landmarks, as you can see. And this landmark acts as a town center, produces villagers 200% faster at abysmally low cost. Um, so, it, it, I think the villagers, I'm not going to do the math, they're like 15, 20 food. I don't know the exact number because it used to be 75% cheaper now it's 66% um, and also this is the only landmark in the game that also costs cheaper so this is the only imperial landmark that costs 1920 food and 960 gold so this is usually the go-to choice for uh, HRE players because even if you lose villagers even if you're low on villagers you can uh, print out insane amount of workers and um, catch up with your economy to the opponent or recover your economy and you will go mo uh, this one most of the time on the other side you got Elsbeck Palace which is basically like a keep landmark and same like with the other sieves uh, the time where you go for Elsbeck Palace is if you're about to die and you're super far ahead in villagers and you just need that a little bit of extra oomph to survive or if you opened two or three TC with HRE, and if you're about 100 workers or 80, 100 workers, whatever, and if you're going Imperial, it doesn't really make sense to go Palace of Swabia because you already got the worker count up, so you could go Elsbeck Palace instead. Kind of a little bit situational. So, yeah. Last sieve we'll be talking about is Chinese sieve, and Chinese sieve has... Uh, uh, dynasties as well as two landmarks per age but China is a sieve that can go for both landmarks in every uh, age up so let's get started uh, Imperial Academy and Barbican usually you will not usually 99% of the games pretty much always you will go for both of these landmarks very very early uh, Imperial Academy is usually the one you go for first and the reason for that is you can trade Imperial officials there uh, and drop off taxes so it's a very good landmark to just kind of boost up your economy, boost up your gold income. And you will follow it up shortly after with Barbican of the Sun, uh, which is basically like a keep. But other, uh, unlike Kremlin, uh, Barbican is a lot better. Uh, and it can be upgraded with Springald and then bomb, uh, 
bombard whatever it's called upgrade in imperial and it gives you a lot of vision and you don't sacrifice anything to go barbican you want to go barbican and imperial academy because you will activate the song dynasty and get 35 percent faster village reproduction which is crazy crazy good um uh, castle landmarks astronomical clock tower and imperial palace um i would say almost always you want to go astronomical clock tower it acts as a siege workshop so not only you get siege workshop instantly but you also produce any siege with 50 percent more health which is obviously very very good and makes them the strongest siege units in the game imperial palace uh is often placed as close to your opponent as possible because it gives a massive uh sight radius so you can kind of use it like a like a huge scout basically and the closer you place it to your opponent or to the middle of the map the more vision you're going to get on the map and you can also click to activate the location of enemy workers so if you're not sure where your opponent's workers are you can click that and, and find out and go harass their villagers now usually you go imperial palace after you go into imperial so you basically go Imperial and then you go back to Imperial Palace to activate the, I think it's a, uh, fuck, what is the dynasty called in Castle? Yuan? I think it's Yuan, which gives your units uh, movement speed and also unlocks Fire Lancers. So technically you're going to have both of these uh, landmarks because of that. And then Imperial Landmarks for China, Spirit Way recently changed and Great Wall Gate House actually recently changed. It used to be just a wall that increases the health of your walls, or it used to be a gate, but now it acts as a keep that you put over the stone walls. It's a gate, it gives 25% range damage to all units on the walls, and it comes with two nest of bees in placements on top of it. And I can tell you this thing does a lot, a lot, a lot of damage. And I would definitely suggest to go for this landmark, why is this landmark better than other keep landmarks? Well, it's very simple. It doesn't require you to make a choice between Great Wall Gatehouse and Spirit Way. You can get both. Where other sieves, usually if they want to go for the keep landmarks, they have to sacrifice the economic ones uh, or the, the, you know, the, the landmarks with some kind of bonus in order to make them. Not China, Chinese sieve though. They can still get the Great Wall Gatehouse. And then you got the Spirit Way. That basically unlocks um, the research cost of your uh, dynasty unit technologies is 50% reduced and 100% research speed, so 100% faster. And also gives you a unique bonus when a dynasty unit is killed, nearby units will receive 20% attack speed and 20 health over uh, 10 seconds, so 2 health per second. So if you want to get all the uh, landmarks with China, you can. Uh, you would preferably always want to go for Song Dynasty, so always complete these two first for that extra villager production. And then what you would do is go Castle with Extronomical Clock Tower into either Spirit Way or Great Wall Gatehouse, depending, again, if you need a defensive landmark or offensive uh, gatehouse to, to you know, help push or kill your opponent. And then if you want both Imperial Landmarks and you want uh, a Siege-based play, I would say, uh, you want to go Imperial Palace first, and then you complete the second Imperial. The reason for that is, the dynasty you're in depends which last landmark you've built. So, for example, if you go Imperial Palace and Astronomical Clock Tower, and then you complete the Imperial landmarks, you will be, be in Ming Dynasty, which increases health of your units. But if you get to Imperial with, let's say, Spirit Way, you didn't build the Great Wall House, and then you go Imperial Palace as well, you will activate um, Yuan Dynasty and make your units move faster. The problem is, if you ever want to decide to go to build this landmark as well, you will activate that Dynasty and you will lose the movement speed bonus. So it matters which one you want to end up with, which Dynasty you want to be in, the one that gives you bonus health or the one that gives you bonus movement speed. If you're playing more siege oriented, you go for the Imperial, uh, you go for the Ming Dynasty, and if you want to go for like Fire Lancers or Cavalry or Palace Guards and run around everywhere, you want to go for Castle uh, Dynasty, aka Yuan Dynasty, as your final one. Uh, yeah, Ming is right here. And that is pretty much it. That is every landmark in Age of Empires 4 explained. 
I hope I helped you understanding which landmark to go win, which landmarks are situational, which landmarks are not. And if you didn't understand any of the landmarks, I hope I helped you guys as well with that. If you're watching on YouTube, let me know what kind of video you would like to see next. Thank you so much for watching. If you're watching on Twitch, let's keep going.